Welcome to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 10. When I'm making a film, I'm the audience. Martin Scorsese. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, guys, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I'm super, super excited today about our guest. But first, please go to freefilmbooks.com. That's freefilmbooks.com to get your free audiobook. I like uh, the film books, of course, but there's over 40,000 books. There's also a lot of great self-help books um, and entrepreneur books, business books, uh, and just good old-fashioned fiction. So uh, head on over there when you get a chance. So today's guest is Susan Lyon. She is an independent producer I've known for a few years. Uh, she's done uh, over a dozen um, feature films, uh, produced over a dozen feature films, and wrote a book called uh, Indie Film Producing, The Craft of Low-Budget Filmmaking. She lives in the low-budget world, uh, even though her some of her first films were uh, 10 or $15 million uh, or more um, with huge stars. She's actually uh, made her bones in independent film and low-budget independent film, the $5 million and below uh, budget film. So... Uh, Suzanne was giving us such amazing information uh, that our interview went uh, almost an hour and a half. And what I've decided to do now is anytime it breaks an hour and 10 minutes or so, uh, I'm going to start breaking it up in two uh, two parts so people uh, have a chance, you guys have a chance to, uh, to digest it all. Uh, and you don't have to sit down for a full hour and a half to enjoy it. You can break it up into two 45-minute pieces. So uh, this is going to be part one of our interview with uh, Suzanne Lyons. Enjoy. Thank you, Suzanne, for uh, coming on to the Indie Film Hustle podcast. We really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. I'm excited. So uh, can you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Oh, my, that's a hard question. Because <laughs> um, you know how I like to talk. But no, I'll keep it brief. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, Alex. Yeah. Um, anyways, I've been in the industry now. I came out, my husband and I came out here in 93. Wanted to be here for the uh, earthquake, you know, in 94. <laughs> Didn't want to miss anything. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. We're not that bright. But uh, anyways, so we came up with the intention where I was going to jump right into features and he was going to jump into, into uh, you know, television. And then I got sidetracked, you know, as you know, uh, for, for a number of years, for probably about five or six or seven years, just because I started teaching marketing because I found it was missing in the entertainment industry. It was driving me crazy that, that people could not get out there and promote themselves. Nobody was thinking of themselves as the president and CEO of their company. You know, people were saying, oh, I'm going to wait till my agent gets me a job. I'm going to wait till my manager gets me a job. Oh, it's not my job, Suzanne. That's my attorney's job to manage my life. And it just <laughs> made me crazy that people kept, you know, handing their power over, you know, from their life to, to somebody else and really disempowering themselves. So my background was a lot in marketing. I was the VP of marketing for a TV network in Canada for years and years and years before we moved here. And uh, so I started this company with Heidi Wall called um, Flash Forward Institute back in 94. I'd literally have been here three months and we started the company. That's how much it was driving me crazy. And even watching my husband, you know, who mm -hmm. was just this amazing writer, amazing writer who came out here. We came out, we were in Philly for five years and he had 17 feature scripts and TV scripts in his, you know, in Bag his briefcase. Right. Honest to God, they sat in the closet because he kept waiting for the agent to call. He waited two and a half years, you know, by oh. that phone. I'm not lying. Oh. And I kept saying, please take my class. Please take my class. Within um, within literally three months of taking the class, he was on staff at the Highlander series. And that was, oh, oh God, cool. what's that, almost 20 years ago? And yeah, I remember stopped. that. That was a yeah, great show. Yeah, he's been a showrunner. And I mean, he's now a showrunner and he's doing, he's been going strong ever since. Good for but, him. So I kind of got sidetracked, and then my uh, business partner in film, Kate uh, Robbins, and I started in 98, I think it was. We finally started Snowfall Films and developed some screenplays, and then in 2001, I think it took us about three years to kind of, you know, launch our first film, and and uh, we did, and it was great. It was a little bigger than planned in terms of the actors and, and so on, and it was called Undertaking Betty, and um, we shot that in Wales, our first one, so I kind of, my very oh, wow. first 
thing was learning international co-production. <laughs> and then I did another international co-production, Jericho Mansions. Um, those first movies were were like, you know, James Caan and Jean-Vierre Bougeot and Jennifer Tilly and then Chris Walken and Naomi Watts and Brenda Blethyn and Alfred Molina and Lee Evans and really great, Robert Pugh, really great, great, great people I had the privilege to work with. And then jumped right into Bailey's Billions, a kid's movie. Uh, so from romantic comedy to thriller to a kid's movie with Dean Cain, right. um, which was so much fun. And um, um, who else? Oh, my God. Anyway, some other great names in it. And then came back and did helped do the financing um, for another project called uh, The Heart is Deceitful, above all things. Okay. And uh, so that was great experience. So that was with another bunch of huge stars. So those my first four movies were all bigger than what Kate and I had planned. Usually people start, you know, at a little one and move up. Of course, up. So- of course. Yeah, I was going to say, it sounds a little <laughs> like, yeah, my first my first in the film, film, yeah, we went to Wales and exactly. yeah, we had these stars yeah, in it. I'm like, to- yeah, I'm like, this is a fairly <laughs> not traditional way of doing things. But I'm, know, I'm, I'm assuming you learned so much in those first few movies. Oh my God. Yeah. It was so, honestly, because to do the five to 10 million, which was not our plan, trust me, at the beginning, you know, it was like being thrown into the fire. And thank God there were two of us because to have, to be able to have somebody to bounce things off of, sure. you know, it was, it was, it was really tough, you know, to go through that learning curve at that budget level with those kind of actors. But we were older, you know, I mean, it's not like we came out here in you our 20s, you yeah, know. Yeah, exactly. I was in my, you know, probably early forties at that point. And, and I just, uh, and, you know, kind of took one day at a time and, and I'm all about kind of trying to relax and have some fun and, and made sure that no matter how crazy things were getting on the outside that people didn't need to know about on set, you know, uh, that what we were dealing with, with the studios and financiers and, and attorneys and all of that stuff till two in the morning, mm-hmm. I'd get up and get on set, you know, at eight in the morning and smile and bring candy to everybody and, you know, take the actors to lunch and, you know, acknowledge the crew every day. And, mm-hmm. you know, I just made sure that people knew as little about all the chaos as possible. And that's just, a job you know, of a, that's a job of a good producer. Yeah, really. I mean, it was all about, let's have some fun. Let's be creative. Let's, you know, let's make a great movie here. And, uh, so just making sure everybody was looked after and, uh, and, and didn't feel the stress and strain. And that's something that we took home with us and made sure we stopped at the grocery store and picked up a bottle of wine, uh, <laughs> to help with those calls with all those attorneys around the world and <laughs> right, right. All the I studios get... and, and everything. And eventually I think that bottle of wine became a case of wine at one point, I think. <laughs> daily, the grocery daily. Store would stand outside. Yeah. <laughs> just put it in the trunk for, us, but <laughs> oh, they're they're but, back. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> look like they need a drink. Here you go. <laughs> so you were saying that. Uh, so that you were fun. saying that the, um, your budget for that first movie is between five and ten million, which is almost yes. uh, a unicorn at this point. It's a non-existent budget at this That's point. That's right. Is That's it? Right. What is it? The, the budgets generally top up at like two to three million tops right now. And yeah. then it, and then it goes into 20 plus, right? Or is- That's right. Cause then once you hit a, that certain number, then you're, you know, then it doesn't make sense anymore because you'd need to have, well, Tom Cruise, you know, or you need name, to be right. at the studio level, which is, you know, 20 and over. So I encourage people to do the lower budget ones. In fact, what Kate and I did after those first four, just kind of, it all happened, you know, uh, simultaneously as England was kind of shutting down their incentives, uh, which affected the rest of the world dramatically. Cause that was kind of the base for a lot of us as indie producers because that's where that first 40 percent came from and then you would attach mm-hmm. on another country and then you okay. do your gap and pre-sales back then remember the pre-sales pre are they do those exist anymore no but they did then in a big way <laughs> oh, I mean huge. we would sell yeah Germany was five hundred thousand dollars Spain was five hundred thousand I mean yeah. you know be, before you'd even blink you know if you had a couple of actors on board you know uh we did two million in pre-sales and oh, then uh, our investors were at were two and then you know, then we had a gap, and you know, uh, from uh, the Lou, Lou Horowitz, I think everybody used back then. There was that gap, mm-hmm. but but the, you know, a lot of the a lot of the money was soft money that you would sh- you know get from from the various countries and the incentives and so on. So, really, was not very hard. That the structure was so beautifully set up at that time. And Kate and I kind of had the benefit of starting at a time when we were able to use that, uh, those incentives in that structure and that format. But then when that shut down in 2004, 
just this is completely ironic, but what happened at the same time is Section 181 was passed after six years of the Directors Guild, you know, uh, lobbying in Washington, mm -hmm. um, that Job Creation Act uh, for the entertainment industry, for the investors to to get 100% tax write off at that certain uh, pay, you know, scale. Of course, yeah, nice. um, was uh, was a godsend and something we haven't had here, I think, since the 70s in the U.S. So Kate and I were able to come home, meet with our wonderful husbands, and and uh, who we missed because we were doing a lot of shooting in other places, but uh, to come home and be able to um, to shoot on American soil was really fun uh, for a change. And uh, and then uh, some of the states started adapting, you know, what Toronto, what Canada and the UK and, and uh, Australia and uh, Romania and those countries were doing by creating these incentives. And, you know, you'd have... Um, you know, a lot of different states. I mean, now many, many states, but back then, you know, there was a couple of them which were great. Also, the unions started to really work toward stopping runaway production. So they started making it doable, you know, here to Deals, be able to right. hire uh, SAG actors, you know, which of course you couldn't uh, at the budget levels that, you know, we were wanting to come back and work on. So it was really fun. And then at that point, the horror films were very, very popular. So Kate and I said, you know what, let's start doing SAG Ultra Low, $200,000 budget. Quite a change from nine million, <laughs> but um, but it was so much more fun because you know we still have to put your name in there or your you know giant spider or something, but it was uh, you know you, you, it wasn't as, as kind of crazy as it was when you know shooting the the bigger budgets and the stress that goes with that. I'm not saying it's not a big job and and still takes a you know a year or two of your life, but um, it was a lot of fun. So we did four of those right away to, in, in a two-year period after coming back. And then um, the market, of course, you know, collapsed like everything in the world and, you know, when the recession hit. <clears throat> and um, so I used that time to write a book uh, for Focal Press called Indie Film Producing. Mm -hmm. I started doing blogs. I think I did – I'm sorry, uh, video blogs, which were – I think I did 125 of those, which are online, and uh, called the 10 Tip Series. I did – three and a half years worth of monthly newsletters called the 10 tip series. So I started using all those, the courses I used to teach and flash forward and, um, turned it all into a 10 tip series just for fun. It was all free. And then I started teaching an indie film class, nice. which is what the book was based on for about three or four years. So I kind of had some fun there. I still did a movie in the midst of the recession. I'm probably one of the only people, I think in 2010, uh, oh I was shooting God. in New Orleans, yeah, which yeah. was great fun, a children's movie. Um, and that budget was around $5 million, so that was a little bit bigger and some really wonderful people that I worked with on that as well. Now, now in 2010, you had a budget of $5 million. <laughs> I know, is isn't that crazy? That's nuts. I know. It's crazy. But it was with the WWE, uh -huh. and they're – they were uh, really wanting to uh, shoot all their movies in New Orleans at that point, and their budgets were all pretty similar, three to five across the board. And um, oh yeah, that's um, the, the the WWE. Um, yeah, like the the Marine and yeah, the uh, wrestler. Yeah, the wrestlers. So, and, yeah, sure, sure. That's right. In our rest, we had to, yeah, we had Triple H was ours. Oh, okay, the dad and Ariel went the bus right the little, on the yeah, bus. He's the, the bus yeah, right. Yeah, right. I, I saw the trailer. I saw I saw the trailer for that. It was, yeah, it was a lot yeah, of fun. It's totally cute. <laughs> we had a very great great director and um, great writer. It was, a, it was a really, really adorable movie. Ariel Winter from Modern Family. She was just a little girl at the time. Mm -hmm. My God, she was 12, I think. Um, so that was great fun. So I did that in the midst of just kind of taking time to, like I said, do these video, you know, blogs and, and write my book for Focal Press and, um, and that sort of thing. So just kind of regrouped and had some fun and then decided, you know, what was next. And then what, what I did after that was started working on another project that shot two years ago uh, with Susan Sarandon and Donald Sutherland and um, uh, Topher Grace and some wonderful, incredible people. Um, and then right after that, I got a call from our Vista because gone into pitch to them a few around that time, actually. Mm -hmm. um, 2013, I believe I went into pitch. And about a year later, last May, I got a call saying, would I come in and kind of, you know, do their first uh, genre film for them? Oh, nice. So they chose one of the ones that I had already had by Laura Brennan, phenomenal writer. So I went in and 
my line producer on a bunch of my other movies joined me as a producer this time. And we went in and did that last fall, which was so much fun. It's called Most Likely to Die. Of course. Oh my God. <laughs> so we kill people in such great new ways. It, you've just got it. When it comes out, you have to see it. It's so much fun. Oh, that must be fun. Uh, as long as you don't get too scared. I barely could watch it during the screening. I swear to God, I was so scared. And I knew what was going to happen. And I was scared. I had to right. close my eyes. Right. And then I just finished a movie with Mark Rossman. I've been work, trying to work with Mark for years now on this project called Time Toys and uh, about a group of, of boys who, um, 13 year old kids who find a chest of toys from the future. So oh, that cool. we're in post right now, literally meeting with sound uh, designers next week. Um, we have our composer, we're doing spotting next week on that, on the music and doing the visual effects at the moment. So our goal is to be, have the movie uh, complete by um, mid-December. Oh, nice. So we're yeah heavily into post at the moment. So you're a bit, so you're a busy lady. Yeah, I just, that was my twelfth. Just finished my twelfth film. Nice, yeah, not in, bad. Uh, in that short time since yeah, two thousand and two. So it was. Um, it's been it's been fun. So now I'm kind of just taking a little bit of a break now that I'm in post and seeing what's next. You know, right. I just uh, um, am looking at what's the next direction. You know, is it doing more of the of these that are kind of under a million, the SAG modified, the SAG ultra lows, having some fun with that still? Um, or is it going back to more of the of the bigger uh, budgets, you know, I mean, there's in fact, one of my friends, you know, who's on partnering with me on a project is at a meeting today with investors in Northern California. And that's a $15 million budget because it's based, uh, it's a uh, based in, in World War One. So, oh, wow. But I'm assuming there's, there's some stars involved with that. Yeah, yeah, that will be <laughs> that will be bigger. Yeah, they're, they're already are. We'll see how that pans out. Right now, it's we're we're trying to do this independently of the studios. Okay. So, um, yeah, um, yeah, because it, I mean, we were part. I mean, the studios were interested, but it meant a tremendous amount of changes, and we're mm-hmm. trying to see if we can stay with the storyline, given what a couple of the stars would like to stay with the storyline. So we'll see. You know, if not, then we can always go back to the studio. But I'd like to to see if we can have some fun with this. But I'm cool. not in any great hurry. Like I said, I've got I've got the fall committed um, to. Um, to post on time toys and, and, uh, and yeah, so that's, that's where I'm at right now. I'm not, I'm really kind of almost taking a little bit of a break. Well, thank you for, uh, I'm not reading scripts or, or anything at the moment. I'm just focusing on one thing, which is nice for a change. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for taking the time out to do the podcast. I appreciate oh, you're it. You're welcome. You're welcome. So, you and I go back a long way. We, ha- so, we have, anyway. we have, yes, absolutely. <laughs> so let me ask you, um, can you explain to the audience, uh, the two hats that a producer must wear when working on a film? Yeah, it's great you mentioned that. That's actually the chapter. I think that's the first chapter of my book. Okay. Um, Because I think the problem, I think why Kate and I kind of started fairly successfully versus some other people who were, you know, who we knew at that time, a lot of people that we knew at that time, is because we both come from business, because we were a little older and she was a stockbroker. Um, you know, her background was, was that, and mine was a VP, you know, uh, so I wouldn't at conferences and business and, and taking programs and business my whole life. I even taught business in Philadelphia, if you can imagine to, to small businesses there. Um, so my background was so business oriented as was hers, even though she was a brilliant writer and she had won the Chesterfield fellow. I mean, the biggest, you know, Spielberg competition ever. And, um, you know, it's not that we weren't creative, but we really knew early on that you couldn't just be creative. Yes, you had to have a great script. Yes, you had to develop it. Yes, you had to wear that creative hat. And that was critically and crucially important. But at the same time, you know, you had to wear the business hat, I would say equally. It's called show business. And the word business is even you know, double the number of letters of <laughs> letters show. <than> show. So <laughs> I remember saying to Kate, that must mean something, you know? So we really paid attention. You know, when it came time to opening our LLC, we did that properly. Uh, you know, I read PPMs like crazy operating agreements. Uh, I learned, I took courses, uh, legal courses at UCLA on entertainment law uh, from Mark Litwack, just to make sure I could read contracts. Even though we had an attorney on the first film, I wanted to know what everything meant. I literally typed my own PPM, 26 pages, and my own operating agreement, 26 pages or 27 pages, not because I couldn't copy you know, somebody else's template or whatever, or print out a template, I wanted to force myself to know every word, honestly. <clears throat> and then even after I typed it and printed it, I read it again, and I probably read it 20 times since. Um, 
And I put those, uh, you know, I mean, I, those were part of my class that I used to teach on indie film producing. Um, you know, I just think all of that paperwork is so important. The minute that you start talking, deal with somebody, write something up, do up deal memos. Uh, I would see so many people when I started teaching the classes, uh, you know, who, whose movies fell apart because there was no option agreement done. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was no deal memos done. Oh, well, Suzanne, that person's my friend or that's my sister. I'm not going to do an option agreement with my friend or my sister. I don't care if it's your mother, you know, you Mm -hmm. do an option agreement. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so I really knew early on that the legal elements were critically important and the business aspect was very important. We did a presentation, a sales presentation. I couldn't even find a template for a good sales presentation. They were so fly by night. I even went to other people's sales presentations and was almost embarrassed by them, to tell you the truth. And I said to Kate, you know, we've got to do this properly. So I created a phenomenal template for a sales presentation, extremely successful, I have to admit. Uh, We probably raised the money for those films in, in record time compared to well, my God, I mean, compared to other people, I know people talked about theirs, you know, the same budgets as ours back then, the 200000 And I remember years later meeting up with those people, and they were still talking about it mm-hmm. and not taking the proper action. So I think we just went about things in such a professional way that when it's investors, I think they, when we were on the phone or in person with investors – or at a presentation, I think they just saw that we were people that they could trust with their money. You know, we were serious. We were business women. You know, we were going to take this very, very, very seriously and do everything we could to try to get them their money back, as well as make a creatively good movie and have some fun doing so, mm-hmm. you know. If that's what's make, the point. <laughs> that's exactly. <laughs> and, and we were also very open. That's the other thing, because anytime I did up an operating agreement or a PPM or business plan of any sort. And when I was in sales presentation of of any sort, I always stood in graciousness and generosity and abundance. Because what happens in this industry, even a couple of my early mentors, I remember listening to and and thinking, this is not okay. They kind of stand in scarcity and lack of abundance. And it's kind of me against them. And there's not enoughness, you know, Mm -hmm. sort of thing going on. And I think that scarcity mentality is what's going to kind of kill you. And you're not going to be an opening to great possibility. So when I would be with investors and, you know, one of my investors, for example, was saying one time, you know, I'd love to put a, you know, um, uh, buy, a, I'm thinking of buying a share in your movie, Suzanne. And, but, you know, I just want to see if it would be okay. You know, a couple of my sons are, um, are musicians and they'd love to write a song for the end roll credit. And of course I said yes right away, but I was an opening for that conversation. If I had been one of those people where, you know, like shutting people down, like so many times you see happening, he wouldn't have even asked me that question. He ended up buying three uh, uh, units, three shares in, in the movie because he was so excited. And mm-hmm. he and his wife came out to the set, you know, and another guy, you know, bought six units because I offered the possibility of being an executive producer. You know, I said, if you buy six or more units, you can have an executive producer credit on not just on the front roll on a single card, but also on the billing block on the posters and DVDs and so on. Let me ask you a question. But, what, what is, um, I don't mean to cut you off. What is a, um, um, a block or, um, a uh, unit, as you say, like a share. Like, let's say, yeah, for example, if I'm selling 35 shares on a movie, that's um. Oh, here's another. Yeah, I'll, I'll just answer that and I'll go back a little bit too, because a lot of times, just going back to the business hat versus a creative, people would say, "Oh, well, I had my um, line producer make up the budget, you know, and the budget's 165,000, so I'm going to raise 165,000." But what they don't realize is on top of that, you need Mm -hmm. operating expenses because what's not in that budget are going to be things like, you know, your attorney, your photocopies, your sales presentation, getting the room, you know, the table read room, like a lot of those kinds of things. So you need to set aside a little money for that. Your taxes, you know, your $800 that go to the state, your accountant for that first year afterwards, because no money's going to be coming in yet, you know, so all that. Also delivery. Nobody ever thinks of delivery, Mm -hmm. which is around $25,000. Dollars, you know, know insurance this. alone is five thousand mm-hmm. dollars. So you know, and then finders fee. You know, uh, n- you know, back then it was called finders fee. Now it'd be probably associate producer fee for those people that are part of your team. They're also introducing you to investors, where you're going to be giving them, you know, a percentage. So that was set aside. So my instead of the two hundred thousand dollar budget, my I raised two hundred sixty two thousand five hundred. 
And what I realized when I did the math, and I kind of worked the numbers around the math because I was at the time doing accredited and non-accredited investors, you know, people that make a lot of money, obviously 200000 or more, and then my next door neighbor who's a teacher. You know, I wanted to go to both. Mm -hmm. So my units were only 7,500 or shares, you know, as, as you would call them. So I had 35 of those. So I did the math to get an even number and it came to 200. And 62500 So that's what we raised. $200,000 was the budget. And then, of course, you had your delivery, which came much later. And, you know, the operating cost was paid for, like I said, your taxes for next year and things like that. And um, and then of uh, and then any kind of finder's fee or today would be called associate producer's fee for people on your team that are introducing you to investors and you're getting to know those investors and so on. And I made everybody active, by the way. Everybody was active. People always worry about passion passive and active investors, I made a point of putting everybody to work, not just my finders, but my investors. I mean, one woman called from, you know, Denver, Colorado, an investor, uh, and she said, you know, what, what do I do now? I've sent my check in. And I said, oh, I said, well, how are you at ironing? <laughs> she said, I'm okay. I'm a mom. And I said, good. I said, well, you come on out to the set and I'm going to just put you in with the costume designer and you're going to have a ball. And she did. And she ironed for two solid weeks. Like, <laughs> And she was just, and she's like, I'm in the movie business. <laughs> she had a ball and her daughter came out and uh, her daughter was in the movie. Her daughter was in all three, all the, all those movies. We killed her daughter multiple times, just changed her <laughs> hair color and threw her back on set again. And, um, and the same thing with one of my other investors, a great guy who who owns a lot of businesses here in Burbank, and uh, he and his son are in <laughs> every scene. We just would change their their look and throw them back in and kill them again. So, I mean, we had you know people really had fun. Our investors had a great time. They came, they flew in from New York, from Seattle, from Denver. Uh, I mean, they really had some fun. And and like I said, and I put them all to work, you know. So, um, that's so that's a, kind of how I did my, my presentation is standing in abundance. What, what harm does it do to, if you bought three units, you'd get an executive producer credit on a shared card. You know, mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm. that when the six unit thing got a lot of people excited because a lot of those people, this one millionaire from Philadelphia, he wanted to start his own film company, but he had no credits. So this kind of got him involved, got him, you know, enter, you know, educated a little bit, got him a credit on a movie, you mm -hmm. know, got him on the billing block on the poster. So he was then able to then promote that when he was then going out to do his, his first film. So it was a win-win for everybody. And it's sad that people don't think like that, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're always just trying to think about themselves or like scarcity as opposed to abundance. I see what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. So what do you, what do you look for when you're hiring a director? I know that's a a, a thing that a lot of directors like to to know, myself included. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I and I've made some mistakes along the way. You know, just so you know. <clears throat> um, I think what I'm always trying to tell people is that. First of all, I'd like to, I want to always hear the vision. You know, when Kate and I would interview uh, directors uh, for one of, I mean, just one particular project I remember, uh, it was fascinating to hear the vision. You know, how far off, you know, we thought they were from the script, you know, I mean, how completely far off. And sometimes how amazing it was their ideas, how it added to the script and enhanced the script like crazy, which is what you really want. That's what a director is all about, is how are they going to enhance it? So to me, it's like, you know, what is that vision? And I think as the director coming to that meeting is really kind of get a sense of, uh, you know, a really clear sense of that vision, you know, before coming to that first meeting and, and seeing if you're kind of on par with what you think, you know, the, the producers are looking for and that sort of thing. And also be honest about <clears throat> where you're at. In one case, we had a director who had come from television great television director and uh it, it not not in the US and different country and um and he was very well known for that and very good but what he didn't tell us was he hadn't I knew he hadn't done a feature yet, but we didn't know his level of insecurity. And I don't even know if he knew. So maybe he wasn't going to be honest with us because maybe he didn't know the level of his insecurity. <clears throat> but even if he knew a little bit, I wish he had shared that with us because I find you can deal with anybody 
as long as you know their weakness, because then you can all work together on the strengths. So what happened during that movie is that he screamed and yelled at people on a Mm. daily basis for weeks. Oh, man. Really hard on the crew, really hard on the cast to go through that uh, abuse and obnoxious behavior for that long and unnecessary at all of our ages, unnecessary at any age. You know, it's not Mm -hmm. even elementary school, is it okay? Where you might see some of it on a playground there. But this is not the playground, you know, that you get to play in at at that age. This is a playground where people want to be empowered and inspired to be their best and be creative. And it shuts people down, you know, when, when they're being abused. So, you know, if he, even if he had said, listen, I'm nervous, girls. You know, I'm nervous about going into this. I'm brilliant at television. I think I can be brilliant at this, but I need the team. I want the support. You know, I want my support of everybody. And on the first day, if he said, listen, guys, I need everybody's support. You know, I've worked with directors since who have said that, who literally said, I want your support. I don't know. You know, if somebody has a better idea, please let me know, because here's the way I see it, and here's my vision, but I'm open, you know, Mm -hmm. um, because it's my first time doing this or my first time that, you know. Or even, you know, like I was in, I was teaching a, a class the other day where they, they, we were doing a, a Q&A to a writing class and the writers were asking the same thing as, you know, and I'm saying, listen, if you're an asshole, there's nothing wrong with it. Just tell the person up front because we can, <laughs> we're all assholes at, at some, it's to some degree, right? Mm-hmm. We've all got those insecurities and fears, God knows. But if we tell each other, if we kind of tell one on ourselves and say, here, you know, here's an area that I know that. I'm working on right now because it's a weak area and I'm strengthening that so I can be the best person I can be. I'm a great writer or I'm a great director, but you know what? When it comes to certain skills with people, I'm not as great. I'm great with actors, but sometimes with crew, I'm a little bit short with crew. And Suzanne, I'm working on that right now because I'm not going to let that happen on this movie. And if you catch me being an asshole, call me on it. You know, I mean, if mm-hmm. that's we have to support each other and, and bring up those strengths as opposed to hiding them. Because when you hide them, then those insecurities rear their ugly heads when you're on set. Right. So sometimes we don't know until it's too late and until we've signed those contracts or whatever, and then you have to live with that. So my thing, would be, I say, is just be honest with people. You know, do your best work. Treat people like gold uh, on set as directors. Uh, I mean, most of the directors I've worked with, like I said, have been fantastic. I would say 95% of the, my, uh, relationships with those directors and their relationships with cast and crew have been amazing and empowering and inspiring. Um, so, I mean, I just went to see Sean McNamara's movie last night. I went to the opening of the Burbank Film Festival, mm-hmm. um, which was so great. And he's and, and I was chatting with all the cast and crew afterwards, and and they were just saying what an honor it was to work with him because he just was so treats people so great that they just want to be their best every time they come to work. And like I said, I just finished the movie with Mark Rossman, and mm-hmm. the same thing. You know, where people were saying the same thing and I watched it before my eyes, you know, where they were just being their best because he was kind of setting that stage for people to, you know, to, to, to be empowered. So life's uh, just, too, li- life's too, thing. life's just too short. <laughs> yeah, it's too damn short. Exactly. <laughs> to deal with and people older, like that. <laughs> honest to God, Alex, and the older I get, the more impatient I am with people about that. Really. I'm like, listen, let's just all be honest with each other. We've all got our flaws. Let's use and, and, you know, take each other's right. advice on, on strengthening those areas and let's just do the best we can do and make the best movie ever. You Did know, you, life uh, is too short. Do you know the comedian Wanda Sykes? No. You never heard of Wanda Sykes? No, I think I've heard, but I haven't seen. Okay. So Wanda has this great bit that she tells about. Uh, she's like, I'm, I can't, I'm not going to curse, but she basically says, as you get older, you just don't give enough. You just, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Like things that you really cared about at 20, you could care less about at 40. Exactly. And at things you cared about at 40, you could really care less about at 60. And exactly. so on. Uh, so, as exactly. the older, that's why older people, they just don't, they just, they do the crazy. They'll walk out in public in underwear, like, I don't care. Yeah. I'm, yeah. A, I'm 85. Yeah. I don't care. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And I'm getting really good at that oh, too. You know? I'm, me, I'm, look, I'm in my early 40s and I'm in mm-hmm. that, I'm in that one. I'm like, oh God, the stuff that I would put up with it when I was in my 30s, in my 20s. Yeah. I'm like, I couldn't, yeah. I couldn't even look at now. So, yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> exactly. It's so true. And it's all about empowering each other so Absolutely. we can be our best in this industry. You know, it's not about belittling each other. But you're a rare, you know? but you're a rare producer uh, in the film business, I have to say, because I've been, I've been in this game for 20 years uh and i've worked with a lot of 
producers, a lot of filmmakers as a general statement, but as a producer, just the way you speak about the process is so unique. Believe it or not, that I'm I'm in I'm empowered just listening to you. Oh great. Uh, uh, about Thank it. You. No, seriously, like most most producers don't think the way you do. So that's uh it's really refreshing. So um Thank you. so let me ask you another question. Um yes. what is a what um what are some things that turn you off when you're reading a screenplay? And oh, I know that wow. could be a whole podcast by itself, <laughs> yeah. But just a couple. I, well, one of the I, it's, it's funny. I just two Fridays ago I was doing um, uh, a Q and A, uh, you know, with a, a writing group. So, um, with screenwriting, you Hal brought me in to do a Q and A, and, and he asked that question. And the, the I think a couple of things that came right to mind uh, for me was to to kind of be. Same thing with with producing and directing and and makeup artist and anything is know your trade. Yes, a lot of people think they're great writers, but they don't know the trade. You know, I got a script recently that was 170 pages. <laughs> I did it have Quint, and, did it have Quentin Tarantino's name on it? If it didn't, no, well, I wouldn't have minded <laughs> if it did. Yeah, exactly. But, so I called the writer. He was in New Jersey, and. <laughs> And he said, um, and he said, I know, isn't that great? You know, like he was very proud of himself. I said, have you even read another screenplay? Did you, you know, go online and find some or buy some, you know, did you, did, you know, did you take a class in it? I mean, did you do anything other right. than just, you know, write this? And he said, no, 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 no. Cause I had my own ideas and my own vision for how I wanted it to look. And I said, are you sending me the 5 million to make this movie? Is there, you know, is there something that goes with this insanity? And, uh, <laughs> and he said, no, no, of course not. I'd like you to, you know, develop and, and then raise the money. And I Send laughed. You know, I said, I said, check. listen, right. call me back in a couple of years, you know, go and take some classes. And I recommended books and classes and, but I'm, You're I'm sweet. not his coach. <laughs> I don't, I shouldn't be the one recommending that it would be equal to me telling you, Alex, that I bought a new set of knives. <laughs> They're not great, okay? One of the, you know, they're not that sharp. Got them at the but dollar I'd like store. To be a heart surgeon, okay? Right. <laughs> and Alex, if you don't mind, okay, I'd like you know, since we know each other and hopefully you trust me a little bit, the knife's not that sharp, like I said. But I'd like to practice on you if that's okay. I haven't done any training as a heart surgeon. It's something I'd like. I've to, seen it on TV. To, you know, that's it. I watched ER. I did. I watched. So you can feel confident in that. That I watched. I did watch one episode of ER where they were doing a heart thing. Just one episode, though. Just right. a piece of one episode. Right, like right. this guy hadn't even read another script right <laughs> but that's i mean as i'm talking you're wow. thinking oh suzanne you're insane that's but insanity. yet that's what i get all the time it's like well no no you know and then sometimes they'll come with the breads that are those little skinny breads where they fall out the minute you open the screenplay i'm thinking uh, if you don't care enough about your profession that would be like me handing out packets at my sales presentation to investors sitting there you know with messy notes, you know right. crooked um, you know, uh, labels on it or, you know, uh, uh, in, in typing know. mistakes or, or uh, that sort of thing. I mean, it would be equivalent to all of that. Not to mention what I see in scripts sometimes with the typing mistakes and all kinds of spelling mistakes. And I'll say to the person, I found, you know, about five or six spelling mistakes in the first five pages. They'd, oh yeah. They said, I know. I said, but uh, they said, I hope you ov overlook that. Cause I really want you to know the story. And I'm thinking, but I kept being taken out of the story because I kept having to correct your spelling. Right. Uh, so, you know, it's like, how can I be present in the story when you don't even care about my hour and a half of time that I'm going to take or two hours to read this? Mm -hmm. So I couldn't even be present. I give it 10 pages at the most. And then if I find those kinds of problems, I stop. Because it's like if somebody doesn't even respect their tra their their craft enough, then, you know, and my time enough, then why continue? So those things sound like they would be so simple, but yet I have to tell you, mm -hmm. it's, I would say probably 80% of the screenplays I get are like that. Because most people, Honestly. because most people want to just want the, they want to be an entourage. They want that lifestyle, but they don't want to put the work in and don't want to learn a craft. Yeah. Uh, and I think a lot of that has to do with the, uh, just people not, uh, not wanting to do the hard work. Which yeah. is, this is a really hard job. I mean, we're not digging ditches, but it, it is, it is a hard, you know, a hard gig to, uh, to make a movie. It uh, is. And I think with writers too, is they don't see it as, <clears throat> as a collaborative process. You know, I mean, if you're going to send me a script, then be prepared to have notes because I'm somebody who's on the other side of the table. I'm in there talking to studios and agents and, 
and people, you know, and sales agents, I know buyers around the world. I go to the markets. I mean, I kind of know what's, what's needed. And, uh, so if you're not open to the notes or anybody's notes, then they should be writing poetry or novels or plays, right. you know, don't be writing screenplays, which end up becoming something that, you know, are probably, it's probably going to be 20 rewrites later, it's, oh, you know, going to um, be good enough to send out to the investor, you know? There's very few screenplays or screenwriters who, who have that kind of power to maintain yeah. that screenplay um, as is. I remember I just read The Unforgiven. Uh, that was one of the only screenplays that Clint's ever not touched. Wow. Like, it just literally, he did, it did it wow. like verbatim. Not one thing was changed in the script. So it's one of those God. weird, can you imagine? But, it, you know, it's a heck of a good screenplay to say the least. Yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you're right. I mean, a lot of times, even those really, really good ones that you think that's the way it started out, probably went through what well, somebody was telling me. I think Hal at the meeting <clears throat> at uh, Screenwriting U a couple weeks ago, <clears throat> somebody mentioned something like 62 rewrites or something, oh. some famous movie that we've all seen. But I guess by the time it got there, it had gone through that because – you know, things change over the years too. And, and, uh, you know, so who knows, but I mean, if they're not open, if people aren't open to that and aren't open to that kind of criticism, Mm -hmm. and then sometimes people will send me scripts and I'm going, what did your coverage person think? Have you already done the rewrite based on your coverage person? And they would say, what's a coverage Coverage person? person. And Hmm. scene. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. And they said, well, we were hoping that you would give me. I said, I'm not a reader. I'm right. not a coverage person. Are you I'm the paying producer. me? Are you paying me? I'm the me? last person you come to, right? <laughs> exactly. If you, want to hear, if you want to hear a funny story, I actually, uh-huh. uh, at school, I had um, an, uh, a professor of mine who was the associate producer on Pretty Woman. Mm-hmm. Uh, he knew uh, Gary. He worked on Happy Days with Gary Marshall. So that's how wow. he got on, on, on Pretty Woman. And he told us the story of the script. Which I don't know if you know the the, the lore behind the the Pretty Woman script. As we all know, the movie just is you know monster hit, a classic now. Right. Um, but when it was first written, the screenwriter called the script was called uh, Three Thousand Bucks. Oh, okay. And at the end of the movie, Richard uh, threw uh, the Ju- Julie Roberts out of the car. Yeah, out of, and and literally tossed the three thousand bucks in her face and drove off. That Not was that, the ending. I did hear that part. Yeah, that was the ending. And the guy, when Gary came in and rewrote it all. Uh, the, the screenwriter was like, this is horrible. I can't believe this. I, yeah, this is not my vision, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> After it made $200 million at the box office, he's like, that's all my idea. And he got, exactly. a, and he got a four picture deal out of it. So it was just, oh my uh, God. but that's, that's the way the business <laughs> rolls. Exactly. And look at ghosts. Same thing with ghosts. I mean, that I didn't know like the ghost. I didn't, I didn't know the yeah. ghost story. What's the ghost yeah, story? That was, that was a very, 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 very dark movie. Oh, really? And then I don't know who it was, the director of the studio or whatever. Jerry Zucker, mentioned. Jerry's, uh, the, the airplane guy, the airplane, who did the airplane and naked gun. What? Yeah. Jerry Zucker, oh. Zucker. Or and that's when they mentioned the whole ter- twist on it about bringing the Whoopi Goldberg kind of character and creating that whole comedic thing and lightening that whole element up and, and just more user friendly, you know, because it was not that supposedly to begin with, not even close from what I understand, but wow. I don't know the whole story, but I mean, and look at now, I mean, that ended up being one of the most amazing, you know, movies. I, I think I've seen it probably five times, just like Pretty Woman. I've of probably course. seen five times. Uh, if you not know? more. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> Where, you know, if you had mentioned that other, I probably wouldn't have seen it even probably once the first time, you know, of course if, not. Uh, given what you said. You of know? course not. Of course not. Yeah. So, um, what would, so what is the proper way writers uh, or filmmakers should submit their work to a producer? Because I know that's a big kind of mystery. Yeah, that's well, that's the other thing, too. And that's what I um, uh, the other thing that I was going to mention is you would not believe on a weekly basis or sometimes daily how many emails I get. <clears throat> I don't know the person from Adam. <laughs> right. I swear to God. Oh, I know. Saw them. <clears throat> sometimes it doesn't even have it'll say, dear sir or madam or most of the time, dear sir. <laughs> I'm thinking what century is this person from, right? Right, right. First of all, dear sir, <clears throat> sometimes dear sir or madam, but uh, very, or maybe, you know, maybe, you know, miss, you know, you know, su- you know Snowfall Films, but <clears throat> sometimes my, maybe even my name. But once again, even if it's, you know, dear Suzanne or hi Suzanne, I've got this great pl- screenplay. <clears throat> um, I, I don't know who they are. I don't know anything about them. There's been no relationship base whatsoever. And secondly, a lot of times they might've gone on my 
<clears throat> website and saw that maybe my, or say maybe on, on, I don't know, whatever site and saw that I might be shooting a horror film. Let's say it was last October, November, when I was doing the horror film for Mar Vista, I was getting a bombardment of horror films. Well, by that point, by the time I was finished shooting, I was done killing people for a while. You know, I wanted to move into something right. fun. I, all I kept saying to people was, you know, give me a family film or faith based comedy. film or romantic comedy. That's all I want to read right now. Mm-hmm. Is you know family faith or or um <clears throat> or or romantic comedy, and uh, but yeah everybody was emailed. But if somebody had taken the two friggin' seconds to call or email and say what are you looking for now? I hear you're doing a horror. I happen to have some horror, but you may be thinking you may be tired of of that. What are you looking for? Because I'm just somebody who's all sense. different genres. It's just or sense. is there any you know? <clears throat> I mean, just I don't know, just something or create some foundation of relationship. I mean, at one point when I was teaching the flash forward workshops, uh, I used to get so, or any workshops, I may used to do speaking engagements, hundreds of speaking engagements all over. I mean, there's, I don't think there's any place I haven't done a speaking engagement in these last 20 years. And on the break, people would say, Oh, Suzanne, I, I you know, I, you mentioned you were a producer. I'm an actor. Here's my headshot. Oh, Suzanne, you mentioned you're a producer. I'm a composer. Here's my reel. Oh, yeah. I, I'm a, I'm a DP. Mm-hmm. Here's my, and I'm thinking, well, who the hell are you? Right? Christ. And then finally I said to Heidi, with, sorry, it's about relationships. It's about, about building a relationship with someone, yeah. at least a, a connection fir- of some sort. Of some sort, it's a first order of business. I used to teach business in Philadelphia, and the very first thing they said, "If your you know, business, I promise you, will fail if number one is relationship first. You know, then there was possibility, opportunity, and the th- the fourth thing, the last thing was action. Mm-hmm. The first was relationship. The last is action. But people would reverse it and do action first. And finally, it got to the point where it made me. So so insanely crazy <laughs> that I said to Heidi at one point, my um, business partner in the Flash Forward Institute, I said, Heidi, I can't take it anymore. We have to create a, a program called the Relationship Seminar because people have to get the distinction relationship or they're going to continue to fail and I can't be part of it anymore. Mm-hmm. I can't watch it. It just breaks my heart. Not to mention, make me crazy. So <laughs> on the plane to New York, because we were going up to teach a class up there, we designed this program, six-week program called the Relationship Seminar. Oh, and nice. here's what it was in a very simple, simple way. I'll tell you what it was. I haven't done one in, oh God, probably 15 years anyways. I should because it was so damn much fun yeah. or more than 15 years. But And it's needed um, now more than ever. Oh my God. I, I honestly, I, people been, been literally, cause Hal, I think did it when I was in, when he was asking me questions last week in that class. And he said, Oh my God, Suzanne, it was so much fun. It was a huge class. And you know what it was, it was six weeks long. The homework was to have a party every week for six weeks. I didn't care if the party was with three people at Starbucks or 300 people in your backyard. I didn't care, but it had to be a party. And for six weeks, you were not allowed to talk about your career or not allowed to pitch yourself or your projects unless somebody asked you. If somebody said, you know, what do you do, Alex? Then you could say, well, you know, I'm a director and this, but you were not allowed, Alex, to for six weeks, not Uh, allowed to tell anybody what you did, not allowed to talk about your resume, not allowed to pitch anything like that. And it, people were just freaking out. I remember people <laughs> out crying. It was 160 people in the class, 162. I'll never forget it. It was a huge seminar. And people were like, oh my God, screaming at Heidi and I, and you're insane. And we can't do that. And, you know, we've moved out here from Idaho to, you know, to start my <laughs> acting career. And what are you saying? And screaming at you, but nobody walked out. Cause I said, there's the door guys, right? right. Not one person left. And I said, okay, is it a promise? And I made everybody sign a contract. And, uh, and, and I said, but you know, have a party and those parts, but I said, have parties of things that you love to do. Cause out there in the business world, when the guys are getting together on Sunday morning to go golfing, they're not talking about their business right away. They're yeah. talking about golfing. Right. They're talking about the football game that's played yesterday. They're talking mm-hmm. about their kids, their wives, the food that they ate, the dinners. The, you know, I said, be, you know, you've forgotten who you are for the love of God. You've forgotten how to have conversations. You've forgotten talk, to talk about your hobbies and your loves and your passions in life outside this industry. That's what creating relationships all about. That's what outside this city in Hollywood, outside our little you know, borders, people talk about their lives. Mm -hmm. We don't do that in here. We talk about our goddamn resumes. That's what what my wife says. She's like, I can't go to a party with you anymore because every time it's everybody's like, what do you do? Here's my next project, blah, blah, blah. She's like, I can't stand it. (laughs) Yeah. It's, isn't it crazy? It in is. no place else, no place else in the world, no other industry in the world 
does that. People create relationships first, and then they take actions. Well, honest to God, so say, for example, you loved whitewater rafting, Mm -hmm. and you knew that I liked whitewater rafting, and you knew, Alex, that I knew that studio exec that was looking for a director who you wanted to work with, right? Mm-hmm. So you and you know that she likes whitewater rafting too. So we all go, so you invite us all to go. And the reason I'm saying, yeah, I'm, and you say, Suzanne, please invite your friend. And I'm okay with inviting my friend because I know that you're not allowed to hit her up for any directing gigs. Right. Because you're not allowed to talk about directing. Right. Unless she asks you. So we all get together and then we go have fun whitewater rafting. Or we, you know, for in my case, I'm a raw, you know, raw cooking kind of chef, right? Oh, cool. so, very cool. And, I'm actually vegan, so that's actually oh, really cool. interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I've taken lots of programs and, you know, classes on, on raw cooking. So, you know, I would have like-minded people. <clears throat> I'd be able to say to my actor friend who knows that investor that I've been wanting to meet, you know, bring him along. I know he's vegan too, and I know that he's looking at raw, and I know you're raw vegan. So let's get together, and I'm going to, you know, we'll do three or four different recipes together, and it'll be a fun Sunday afternoon. And I'm not, she doesn't have to worry that I'm going to hit up her friend, you know, on a project because we're going to talk about vegan and raw vegan food Mm -hmm. period that's it and i just have fun and just have some fun then if something happens here's what's interesting alex at the end of the first two weeks i mean i'd been leading flash forward at that point for probably eight years right and that was a week a month-long course where you set a goal and you had a full team where you know that helped you accomplish that goal and get that agent or get that job or whatever right in two weeks of this one new course we had more people get jobs I think then in all the eight years of flash forward combined, it was frightening. I mean, and nobody was allowed to share themselves. This one guy said he was going to New York on the airplane, sat beside the guy. They talked all the way there, five hours, six hours, talked and talked and talked. He said, I hit it up with this man. He said, we just had the most great fun time. Then we watched a movie and then we chatted more and just chatted about life and everything. And he said, then we were starting to land. And the man said, oh, by the way, what do you do back in L.A.? And he said, oh, he said, well, I'm a writer. Oh, he said, really? He said, well, I'm a producer. What are you writing? (laughs) When they were landing. But the guy asked him, and he he was allowed to say it, right? Sure. But for five hours, they had already shared about life and hobbies. They built a relationship, a small relationship. They built a relationship, exactly. So if we could, if if, if nothing happens but people get this today from our talk, you know, I think that in itself is a miracle. And that in itself is gold. You know, uh, to that I mean, it, it's just a way to live life. Then you'll get more jobs, sell more scripts, get more directing gigs, get more DP gigs, more of that than anything else combined. I hope you guys enjoyed that amazing interview with uh, Suzanne. Uh, if you like this interview, part two has even more amazing information on it. Uh, she is generally a wealth of information, uh, and I uh, I loved reading her book, Indie Film Producing. The Craft of Low Budget Filmmaking. I'm going to put a link in the show notes as well as other links to uh, her personal site and other things like that to get a hold of her. So uh, don't forget to head over to filmfestivaltips.com. That's filmfestivaltips.com so I can show you my six secrets to how to get into uh, film festivals for cheap or free. I got into over 500 international film festivals and I give you all the goods on how I got in. So Thank you so much, guys, for listening. Thank you so much for all the love on iTunes and all the downloads and all the shares. Uh, The podcast uh, and the website is growing uh, substantially very, very quickly, and I'm very grateful and humbled by that. So you keep listening, and I'll keep creating some great content for you guys. So don't forget to come back for uh, part two, which will be released in the next day. Thank you so much, guys, and talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. 